Hello, we'll continue. This is actually a continuation of the balance of God's grace and law. And then uh, this part is about that we should overcome all sins with God's help because sins are destructive. So at the same time we live under grace, we are motivated by God's grace. At the same time we realize the destructiveness of sins. Because we need to understand there is a teaching called uh, grace gospel or uh, hyper grace, hyper grace, uh, H Y P E L. It's a teaching that they just talk about grace and no law, no commandment, no punishment, no repentance. Doesn't talk about those things, just talk about grace. And they think that just talk about grace, then people will change. Now, some people could, but not necessarily all will change. So it's very important that we understand that um, that we should uh, overcome all sins because sins are destructive. That we should uh, uh, not take our sins lightly. That we sh should see that sins are destructive. Okay, now God's nature is that He's holy and His holiness is beautiful. Now many people they don't like to talk about God's holiness because that's too, they say that it's too stern, stern, too strict. But actually God's holiness is beautiful. In heaven there is no more sin and it's beautiful there. Uh, when there is no sin, it's very beautiful there. In Revelation 21, 4, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, uh, for the former things have passed away. And Revelation 22, 3, and there shall be no more curse. So in heaven, there is no more tear, no more death, no sorrow, no crying, no pain, no curse. So everything is beautiful there. And it's beautiful because it's holy there. Holy there. There's no more sin. Now, we, we need to understand God is totally holy. God is totally holy. In God, there is no darkness, no sin. And that is why it's beautiful. Because sin is destructive. Sin is, you know, uh, sin, uh, uh, these are sins. Hatred or uh, f fighting against each other, despise of people, hurting people. All these are sins. And when there is no sin, then things are beautiful, and God is beautiful, and, and God is holy. And when He is holy, we cannot come to Him unless we have the holiness of God, which came from Jesus dying on the cross. When Jesus died for us, we trust in Jesus, then we have His holiness. And we also have the holiness of the saints that we can build up uh, when we trust in God. But we are not saved by doing good. Our good works are not worthy to, be, to bring salvation. It's not perfect. So it's just the fruit. Our good works are the fruit of salvation. And then God, there's a warning. So uh, we talk about the teaching of God, mainly grace, but there is also the law and the commandment what to do, but there's also warning and punishment also. We, we need to understand this. But as I said, my main motivation is from God's grace because I say whenever I obey Him, uh, God is very happy. When I serve Him, uh, He is very happy. When I have any sin, I repent and then God is happy. So that is grace. But I need to re remind myself that sins are destructive. I need to warn myself. But mainly, my motivation is from grace. The warning about sin is just a small part of my life, of my thoughts that I realize that sins are destructive, so I remind myself. But I don't, you know, I don't live under the fear of punishment. I, whenever I notice any sinful thought, I will, <clears throat> I will face it, I will immediately take care of it. And I'll talk about how to, <clears throat> how to take care of that in a, uh, later here. <clears throat> Revelation 2.23, All the churches shall know that I am He who searches the mind and hearts. So He searches our mind and our hearts, everything in our heart, that if we have any dishonesty, we have any filth, any kind of dirt, 
God sees that. And 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So first, 2 Corinthians 5.10 We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now some people, their uh, exegesis, exegesis means interpretation of the Bible, they just interpret by words. They don't see the context. They don't see the whole Bible. And they say there is the judgment seat of Christ and then there is the white uh, judgment throne. And so they classify different kinds of judgment. But actually, in the Bible, if you see all the passages, uh, for instance, in the seven uh, trumpet, that is the judgment time, the time time to judge all those who uh, bring destruction to the world and also all the uh, servants of God will be rewarded and that is the judgment of Christians and non-Christians. So, you know, people say this judgment seat of Christ is just for the Christians for reward. It is not supported by the Bible. We don't just look at a passage and then decide that, uh, the theology from it. We need to look at the whole Bible. When you see the seven trumpet in the book of Revelation, you see that the, the non-Christians the, and the Christians are judged together. Uh, so here, that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one of us may receive the things done in the body according to what is done, whether good or bad. So everything we do, that we have to face God and will be brought up to the judgment seat so we cannot escape that. We cannot run away from that. So nobody can escape from God's, from the eyes of God and the judgment of God. And the promise. Those who pursue righteous holiness will become vessels for honor. So God wants us to pursue righteousness. 2 Timothy 2.20 But in a great house there are not only vessels of silver and gold and silver, but also of wood and clay some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Excuse me for a moment. Okay, so here it says that, like in the earthly house, there are vessels of gold and silver and also wood and clay, and some for honor and some for dishonor. And then it's the same in the house of God, in the house of God, that uh, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, from the dishonor, dishonorable things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. So every Christian can serve God, but many Christians are vessels of, uh, of dishonor, that they're not clean, and so they cannot be used by God uh, in a great way. Uh, and their life could bring dishonor to God. Uh, so we, uh, if we want to be honored by God, we want to be used by God, we want our life to go to a high level and be blessed by God. It's very important that we cleanse ourselves from all the dishonor dishonorable things, or from all the sins, so that we are prepared uh, for every good work, that we become vessels of, uh, for honor. So I hope that you hunger for that and say, I want to be a, a, a vessel for honor. When we are a vessel for honor, then our whole life will be, uh, will go higher. And God will bless us. God will keep us because they, uh, God will treasure this person and, and protect this person exceedingly because this is an important person. So we can see in the Bible that when people want to attack Moses, uh, God will attack those people who attack Moses because Moses is important. God will not let any person 
uh, uh, hurt Moses, that God would protect Moses. And a promise here. So you see that uh, we need to discern what is the promise of God and the warning of God. Now, warning also from, come from God. And we need, need to understand the law is also good. You know, obedience of the law is good. I'm not saying law is not good, but we need to understand that to, uh, the motivation should come mainly from God's grace that because God has punishment also, God has judgment. But as Christians, we should not be motivated mainly by judgment. We should be mainly motivated by God's grace. So in God, there are two main natures, His, His love and His grace and His holiness. <clears throat> And justice. God is both of these natures. And if we are motivated by God's love and pursue holiness, then we're motivated you know, mainly by God's grace and then we can enjoy His grace. But when people don't see the grace of God, they just see punishment. And then because people don't have the strength to obey God uh, by themselves, so we need to have the grace of God to motivate us. That's why Jesus gave us all kinds of promises to motivate us. That He says that my yoke is easy, my burden is light to motivate us to obey Him. So we need to understand that uh, it's important for us to be motivated by God's grace to obey God's law. Uh, and even though both are God's nature, but we want to be motivated by God's grace and to pursue holiness. Okay, and then Matthew 5, 19. This is a promise. Those who obey God will be great in God's kingdom. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men to so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So if we you know, pay attention to the commandments of God and then we teach people to obey them, then obey them then they are great in the kingdom of heaven so we don't just you know have live in the grace of god but we also obey god but there you know uh in this age there are many teachings that uh, has this hyper grace uh, one famous person is called uh, joseph prince another one is joyce meyer and uh joe austin uh austin that these are uh preachers of hyper grace they don't talk about God's law and commandment uh, the only commandment they talk about is giving giving money the other commandments they don't talk about they just talk about giving money so we need to teach people to obey everything God has taught us and Jesus said in the great commandment you know whatever I have taught you you teach them to obey not just to understand but to obey and then sins are destructive. So this is warning. Jesus said to the man, heal of 38 years of sickness. John 5, 14. See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. So uh, the man was healed with, uh, of the 38 years of sickness. And then Jesus said, don't sin anymore. Stop sinning. Uh, if not, if you, don't, if you continue to sin, something worse may happen to you. So this is a warning. So many people thought that after they sin, they just repent and it shall, will be fine. Jesus just warned us about the consequences of sin. For instance, when we sin, when we, when we have anger with people, we yell at people, we hurt people's feelings, there will be consequences. It will hurt the relationship. It will take away our joy and our strength. It will affect our relationship with God. And if we continue to sin, the relationship with God will become worse and worse, weaker and weaker. And also it will destroy the relationship with people. So we need to understand that even though when we repent of our sins, that sins will be forgiven, but there is still destructiveness of the sin that will remain. For instance, David, he committed adultery and murder. And then uh, God said to him, the sword will not depart from your family. That the sword will kill many people in your family because of your sin. So we need to understand that sins are destructive. Now, when I said earlier, when we repent, God is happy. That's true. 
And then we pursue righteousness, holiness. And then we say, okay, I want to turn away from sin. I don't want to sin anymore. And then God is very happy. And then warning, sin will give the devil a foothold and, and he will steal, kill, and destroy. So Ephesians 4.26, In your anger do not sin, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. So here it talks about not to sin. In your anger do not sin, and do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Because when we give the devil, when we sin, when we uh, are angry and sin and, uh, and uh, continue to be angry, then we are giving the devil a foothold. John 10.10, 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. And Satan will come and steal our peace, our joy, our fun. You know, we can have fun uh, in God. We can have fun in our life. He will take away our fun so that we don't enjoy life anymore and uh, take away our faith and our strength and wisdom because when people are in sin they, they, they lack the, the wisdom of turning away from sin they will say things that hurt people that is, uh, that, uh, is foolishness and then Satan will steal their resources they will become poor they will become they would uh, have problem keeping the jobs. They have problem keeping the family, and it will affect your the health and the reputation and the trust of people, and also interpersonal relationship will be ruined, and then the family, the loving family, will be destroyed. And the opportunity uh, to serve God, opportunity in the work and the ministry, and the fruit of the ministry, and God's plan in the life, and the reward. And eternal life. So Satan will steal this thing. I have known Christians, they believe in God for many years, but they, you know, they don't love God, they don't obey God. They let the, uh, the depression affect them, the anger affect them, and then they, they uh, lose, uh, they don't have good relationship in the family, and the family is uh, it's always suffering and a lot of yelling, and then they, they don't keep the job, they uh, they're fired easily. They don't have good friends, uh, even though they, they believe in Jesus. But their whole life, a lot of it is destroyed. So we want to say, I want to keep my life away from Satan so that he cannot steal from me. Because he doesn't just steal a little part. He will steal more and more and more. So you might have heard this story of the camel that wants to put the foot into the, the master's tent. And the master let it put the foot inside, and then later it puts uh, more of his body, the whole leg, and then the whole body, and then the head also. And then finally he kick out the master. So Satan would do that. He will come into our life and steal, kill, and destroy. And then fornication will affect dating and marriage. Okay, and fornication causes God to be angry. Uh, the person involves, involved will lose the favor of God and will give footholds to the devil. Uh, to the devil, and the devil will still kill and destroy every part of his life. So we need to understand that. Uh, you know, some people think that, well, if we have uh, uh, extramarital sex, is like uh, fun, extra fun, but actually that is giving Satan the chance to steal from the person and it's very destructive. It will destroy the family, it will take away the joy of the family and it will dis ruin the person. It will ruin his life and his ministry. And two, and many men think that they have sex with a woman is some gaining something. Actually, they lose many things. They lose the favor of God, they lose a clear conscience, they lose their spiritual strength, and the most wonderful plan of God. They don't, they don't have the most wonderful plan of God anymore. Now, if they repent, they can return to the good plan of God. But sometimes, after a person sin to a certain extent, he cannot return to the most perfect plan. For instance, if a person you know, has lost his, the trust of his wife, he tried to restore that. He has problem returning to the most, you know, the, uh, the most beautiful marriage at the beginning. 
at the at the beginning when the the, uh, the marriage was most more beautiful, and now he would have lost it, uh, and uh, so it's hard to restore that. And if the person has lost the trust of the church, it's hard for him to restore his ministry. So we need to understand that it it was still the most perfect plan of God and the marriage and the ministry. And three, when a woman gets pregnant before marriage, her date might leave her, she might become a single mother and it will lead to serious problems. So now for the woman, for the man, it's also a loss because Satan will destroy and steal and kill his life. And then if for women, uh, the, the influence will be more obvious because she'll get pregnant. And then if she have abortion, that is worse because that's killing a baby. That's murder. That's very serious sin. And then if we uh, get pregnant, then you know it's it will bring a lot of shame. It will bring a lot of problem, and the man might leave her because many women might think, well, uh, he she he wants my body. You know, the woman might think, you know, he wants my body, and then I give her give him my body and then and then he will marry me but actually many men they they want to go from one woman to another woman now even for Christians Christians need to be very very careful so uh, I, I encourage you uh, any Christian women don't think that Christian men are always trustworthy they're not always trustworthy they are trustworthy uh, Christian men, but there are Christian men who are not trustworthy, and don't use a body as a way to keep your the man, because the man might leave you. Because uh, if a man doesn't have a good relationship with God and doesn't realize the destructive destructiveness of sin, when he sees another woman, then he might go after that woman. So it, that's something very destructive. So I hope that that. Uh, in the church, there will be education that uh, that there should be no intimate relationship before marriage. To avoid any you know, close body contact, to avoid temptation. Because when there is close body contact, it's very easy to have premarital sex. Uh, and premarital sex, you know, is something God doesn't like because it's not in a marriage because sex is for the marriage and also quite often then there could be argument after that because then the woman wants the woman the man to marry her and then he doesn't want to get married yet and then there'll be argument and then later the man might leave her so it it will bring a whole lot of problem so sometimes people before they have sex, they think that well, sex will give them a lot of pleasure and a lot of good things. But when they enter it, they find that there's a lot of pain. Actually, Paul has said that that you know uh, that I I wish that you will remain single because when you're single, then you can serve God wholeheartedly. And when you get married, now it's not a sin to get married, but then you will suffer. Paul said that you will suffer because in a marriage. Between a man and woman, there's a lot of misunderstanding. It, man and woman thinks, think differently. So they need adjustment. So if we have time, we'll talk about marriage later. Okay, so uh, the woman might become a single mother, and then it would have different kinds of problems. And then warning, God hates sins and punishes sinners.